Hello, good morning. I'm Ashok Kurokade, consultant rhinologist and anteriorscular surgeon from Winchester and uh, University Hospital, Southampton, UK. I welcome colleagues from around the world on behalf of organizing team to the second day of inaugural winter global rhinology and skull base surgery webathon. Global Rhinology Network is a non-profit organization with a mission to foster surgical education in rhinology and skull base surgery. We have successfully hosted annual multi-center live surgical webcast, The Lioness, since 2014 in collaboration with Lion Foundation. Thousands of surgeons from all corners of the world have benefited from it. More than 2,000 surgeons from 110 countries have registered for GRACE 2020. We had hugely informative and engaging 15 sessions on endoscopic sinus surgery presented by eminent rhinologists and skull base surgeons on day one. We'll be having similar sessions today focused on anterior skull base surgery. This event is hosted at the Global Telemedicine Studio of Professor Wilco Grolman in Utrecht, the Netherlands. It is supported by Medtronic and Carl Stoss. Imagine, what if you could do even more to bring relief to your chronic rhinosinusitis patients with technology customized to your unique clinical and facility needs? Introducing Stealth Station Flex ENT Navigation System, a customizable system from Medtronic ENT, a market leader in image-guided surgery technology. Featuring six hardware configurations, an optional portable card, two different electromagnetic emitter options, with flexibility in hardware design and optional software functionality. Get everything you need and nothing you don't with Stealth Station Flex ENT. Let's flex forward. Contact your Medtronic representative to customize a navigation solution that's right for you. So can I invite uh, again Christos Yagalas? Christos this morning uh, gave a very excellent talk on uh, pituitary and uh, 
cavernous sinus lesions. Uh, so for those who have joined uh, recently, Christos is a, a professor of uh, uh, ENT, so he's with a specialist practice in rhinology, skull-based surgery in Haia Hospital in uh, Athens. And uh, without uh, further ado, I'll invite him to host Dr. Satish Jain. Dr. Satish Jain is uh, going to give a keynote on the nasopharyngeal uh, angiofibroma. Uh, so to you, Christos. So you can start introducing Satish and then uh, we start. Uh, hello. Um, again, it's my pleasure to be here. Fantastic work. It's a marathon, but it's very well planned. And uh, indeed, I have the pleasure now of introducing Dr. Satish Jain who um, uh, has the biggest uh, private uh, surgery center in, in India and has done uh, tens of thousands of operations, both from what I understand in endoscopic sinus surgery as well as in otological surgery. And um, his last experience, I think he's uh, very happily willing to share with us with his uh, lecture on the nasopharyngeal uh, carcinoma. So the floor is to you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Christos, for the uh, introduction. And before I uh, begin, I would extend my thanks and regards to Dr. Ashok Rukade for giving this opportunity to share my small experience with this August gathering. Thank you so much, Dr. Rukade, for giving this opportunity once again. So coming to the topic given to me on something to speak about nasopharyngeal angiofibroma, we all know Juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma is a big challenge to the clinicians for many regions, and the biggest of them is the bleeding. We all know this is a benign tumor of the nasopharynx. Though it is benign, yet it is locally invasive. The thing which, uh, you know, uh, scares the surgeon is the vascularity of the tumor, and it typically occurs in young adolescent males. These are fine characteristic features of these tumors. And since bleeding is a concern, the reason is very obvious. The tumor itself is composed of vascular tissues, vascular channels with intermittent fibrous stroma, and the vessels are just endothelium lined. They're not having a thick elastic or the muscular layers to contract to control the bleeding. That is the reason they give uncontrollable hemorrhage, and that's what the concern to the surgeon. So in this talk, my now, uh, uh, this talk will feature on certain issues about decision making on juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. There are lots of myths and controversies in the management of this tumor. So, the first big challenge is reaching to a correct diagnosis, the appropriate radiological workup, the need for the embolization to reduce the vascularity. This is one of the most commonly practiced things across the world. We'll discuss the pros and cons of that whether to go by the open approach, the traditional one, and now the new endoscopic approach for the last decade or more, which is more and more popular now for the regions which we'll discuss. Recurrence, the so-called recurrence, this is a benign tumor, yet it can recur, but that recurrence, the so-called recurrence, is actually a residual tumor which can regrow. So the strategy to prevent the recurrences and a need in certain cases of radiation therapy will be a focus of the discussion today. So this tumor, as far as coming to the diagnosis, this tumor exclusively occurs in the young adolescent males. So like any young adolescent male presenting with nasal obstruction, history of bleeding, to you put your endoscope and see a mass in the nasopharynx, it cannot be anything else than uh, angiofibroma to your mind. It occurs immediately in your mind as juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. That is how clinically we diagnose it. And we refrain from biopsic lesions for the uh, sake of preventing hemorrhage because this vascular lesion and we don't want that kind of hemorrhage from biopsy. So the diagnosis is again, you know, uh, confirmed by means of radiological findings. And this tumor has a characteristic radiological appearance, characteristic pattern of spread by means of you can pick up on the radiology. The tumor arises in the region of the pterygoid wedge here and then is circumferentially grows to certain preferential areas like nasopharynx, pterygoid process, laterally, anterolaterally goes to the pterygomaxillary fissure into the infratemporal fossa, posterolaterally uh, through the pterygoid process goes to the peripheral space, 
superiorly it can go to the inferior orbital fissure to the orbit and then superiorly posteriorly it can go on from the orbit to the uh, cavernous sinus to the temporal lobe and so on that's how it creates more and more problems so that's how it is diagnosed on radiology with certain characteristic finding so the question comes that what radiological investigation need to be ordered to begin with so by and large the first radiological investigation to be ordered or should be ordered is a contrast enhanced ct scan which gives you a by and large picture of the enhancing tumor with certain characteristic uh, preferential path of spread to diagnose as a jna our philosophy is to not only the contrast ct scan our philosophy now is to order a ct angiogram which not only gives you the benefit of the contrast ct scan the information which you get from the contrast ct scan more than that it gives you information about the vascularity of the tumor that is most important the vascularity information you get uh, out of the ct angiogram is very very important in decision making i hope my uh, ct angiogram is being shared on the screen now may know can you see my ct angiogram yes. shared on this yes we can see it thank you yeah. so when we order a ct angiogram what we recommend uh, clinicians to look at the ct angiogram yourself because we don't only need the information of what vessel supply to the tumor more than that we want the information that the, how the vessel is entering into the tumor how many other vessels are going to the tumor we all know most commonly as the tumor uh, once it starts growing it gets exclusively its blood supply from the internal maxillary artery but as tumor goes to the other areas it acquires more and blood blood supply from the other thing like in uh, parapharyngeal space once it grows it acquires as Uh, additionally from the ascending pharyngeal artery it goes to the skull base it acquires more and more vascularity from the internal carotid circulation and that is a decision making thing for surgeons we should know what are the vessels supplying to the tumor not only that how the vessels are entering into the tumor so that you can take a call whether you can control that vessel beforehand before you handle the tumor so that you can handle it endoscopically or not or there we have to go for the open up process this is one of the decision making factor and here what i am going to show you is how to read the ct angiogram for this particular purpose in a very very simple manner i can go quickly and then we'll go in the details of this see this is a common carotid artery in the neck dividing into the external and internal carotid artery as we go up see my cursor these are lot of branches arising from the external carotid artery the facial artery superior uh, the lingual artery the ascending pharyngeal artery and then this this external carotid artery goes behind behind the angle of the mandible see this and divides finally into two terminal branches see here two terminal branches this one is the internal maxillary and this one is the ascending uh, the superficial tempora so this internal maxillary is of concern as far jna is concerned see now look at this in a dynamic fashion i am following this vessel internal maxillary internal maxillary this is the tumor in the infratemporal fossa nasopharynx nasal cavity this is the pterygopalatin fossa and this is my vessel and see how this tumor and this vessel related to the vessel goes in the anterior part of the pterygopalatin fossa being pushed anteriorly by the tumor itself and go in the anterior part of the pterygopalatin fossa to supply this tumor that is behind the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus and that is an added advantage once you consider endoscopic approach because in such lateral extension or approach is the endoscopic dancers it's not that the medial part of the tumor which you can handle you know endonasally the concern is the lateral most part of the tumor with full exposure and taking the vessel into control what simply you can do what simply you can do see this this is the lateral part lateral most corridor part of the tumor here what we see we need to do remove this medial wall of the maxilla and ent part of the anterolateral part to have an head on exposure to the most lateral part of the tumor sometimes there is more lateral extension you don't need to go far laterally in the linear fashion you can mobilize the tumor in your field but this is by and large the kind of exposure head on exposure you need to the lateral part of the tumor by the endoscopic dancers 
and this you can simply achieve by this approach what we want to know from this endoscopy uh, this uh, ct angiogram how the vessel is entering into the tumor many a times you have seen the branches of the vessel or vessel itself enters the tumor from behind and remain behind the tumor particularly in revision and other situation difficult situation complex tumor and then you have to think twice to take up the endoscopic approach before because then to end to catch the vessel to take the vessel in control endoscopically you have to go through the tumor and that is counterproductive our approach to the endoscopic surgery which i am going to discuss later on is the is based on taking the vessel into control first before entering to the tumor because the moment you enter into the tumor it will show what it is it is so vascular you can't control endoscopically the field the surgical field and then you can't uh, manage the situation under vision so the principle is to catch the principal vessel first many of the cases we are doing without embolization which i am going to uh, share with you the reasons behind that in what cases we embolize what we don't and in majority of the cases when we don't embolize based on this fact that how the vessel enters into the tumor we take a call whether we can take it endoscopically or not so this is one of the most important factor and this dynamic ct angiogram which you can see on your console see this what i was saying you can see 3d this is my vessel which is entering into the tumor see this is the vessel and if i want to see this vessel in all plane i can see here how the vessel is you know see this this is the vessel here uh, let me remove yeah this is the vessel here and see how this vessel at what point of time at what level it enters into the tumor this is how it enters into the tumor so when you open the posterior wall of the maxilla to enter into the pterygopalatine fossa actually in this coronal plane when you see you can have a fairly good idea at what level in the pterygopalatine fossa what height of the pterygopalatine fossa what anterior posterior level by means of three dimensional dynamic ct angiogram you can have a fairly good idea where exactly you are going to find the vessel like for example this in this patient the vessel is here when you open up the pterygopalatine fossa you can get to know the height see this let me again take this see this is the level of the heart palate and i can see this vessel is roughly 1.5 plus centimeter above the level of the heart palate so you can have a fairly good idea where to look for the vessel rather than blindly looking for the vessel and ultimately damaging it so this is the, the beauty of the dynamic ct angiogram that you get the complete information about the tumor the extension uh, the 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 same in, information which you get from a contrast ct scan but more than that additionally you get to know what vessels are entering into the tumor like in this particular patient see this this is the ascending pharyngeal artery arising this is the ascending pharyngeal artery arising and this one of the branch is entering into the tumor from behind see this small small branches entering into tumor but this kind of small branches entering into it you can handle rather than a handling a big branch though this this branch is behind the tumor so you can expect some sort of bleeding when you deliver the nasopharyngeal part so that you have to be prepared it makes you prepare that how much bleeding approximately you are going to have and if you really need uh, you really expect more bleeding you can arrange more blood and you can plan your way according to your experience so this is one information second information about a diagnosis you know for diagnosis what we believe the mri sometimes helps you a lot mri is one investigation which helps you like uh, you know anything let me uh, show you this uh, one of the ct angiogram and the mri this patient see this is i, I told you this is one of the most decision making uh, investigation in mri one of the sequence so like such tumors we get many a times we get such tumor occupying the entire nasal cavity nasal pharynx when the gn is grow like anything and you really do not know whether it is a gna or not because you can't take a biopsy once you suspect a gna and mri certainly helps you in this regard and one of the most important sequence of the mri that is called diffusion weighted mri is a bioimaging bioimaging in the sense diffusion weighted mri calculates the uh, you know water molecule movement 
in the magnetic field mri is a magnetic field so in those lesions who have a high water content will have less diffusion those tumors who have a less water content more cellular more nuclear cytoplasm ratio they will have more diffusion restriction and those are considered to be malignant or more likely to be malignant here such tumors with no diffusion restriction are 100% uh, something you can rule out a malignancy in these we have seen call of patients referred to us with a nasopharyngeal mass in the child assuming a jna for surgery and when we investigated with the mri found huge diffusion restriction and turned out to be malignancy rather than a jna so you can avoid such misdiagnosis by 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 means of you know uh doing a mri in those situations like for example this tumor this is a different situation just to give a fairly good idea about the diffusion weighted mri see this patient see this patient who had a uh, this tumor yeah this was a tumor see this was a malignant tumor why i am saying malignant tumor look at the diffusion restriction this rules out any benignity of the tumor rules out jna rules out any other benign tumor and this is one of the most important sequence pre operatively when you are not take uh, supposed to take a biopsy to confirm or to rule out a malignancy so this is second point in the diagnosis which is sometimes very very important third point in the diagnosis is the need for a open approach or uh, you know you to take a call between the open approach and an endoscopic approach our our philosophy uh, to take a call between open and the endoscopic approach depends upon a lot upon the uh, ct angiogram number 1 and number 2 the extent of the tumor and number 3 the vasculitic coming from the intracranial circulation see once you are removing any tumor endoscopically if is the tumor is getting additional vasculitic from the intracranial ica uh, or part of the intracranial circulation if you try to avulse the tumor from below it can lead to retraction of the vessel from above and can bleed intracranially and can be a disaster so that is one factor second factor is the extension of the tumor see in endoscopic in our series majority of the cases we do endoscopy except some example which i am going to show you some situations in and endoscopic is not a contraindication for a big lesion i tell you any big lesion can be removed endoscopically provided you need a space to maneuver your endoscope provided you don't have a vasculitic coming from the intracranial circulation look at this example this particular patient had a huge tumor let me show you how big the tumor is now if you want to take it endoscopically you can but see look at the size of the tumor look at the not only size where will you maneuver your instrument where will you maneuver your telescope instrument the visualization see to begin with the moment you put your endoscope in the nasal cavity is all tumor you can't maneuver and the principle in such tumors uh, because of the vascularity the principle is to not to go into the tumor before taking the vascularity in control whatever embolization whatever you have done you are not supposed to go into the tumor directly to create hemorrhage to give hemorrhage and to make the situation worse so in such situation see such a huge tumor where you don't have a space to even put your endoscope these are tumors i would say are relatively uh, where the endoscopy is contraindicated to make your life so difficult to make your surgical course more longer even in if you do heroics you try to manage it endoscopically try to segmentalize it it is going to take so long overall bleeding is going to be so long and such young children see this 12 year young with so much of surgical time with so much of blood loss is something um, you need to think twice before taking such a call and second indication for endoscopy see this this particular tumor it looks so good to remove by endoscopic approach we have removed many such tumors by endoscopic approach which has extended to the intracranial space this tumor has a tendency not to invade dura in the beginning so majority of these tumors are extra dural now the, the the challenge comes if the tumor acquires the blood supply from the one of the intracranial vessels which i am coming to uh, this is opening i am going to show you see this huge tumor vessel huge tumor vessel this is another you know relative contraindication 
because such tumor vessels are difficult to call even with the whatever good embolization you do uh, the embolization reaching to the microvasculature level is so difficult in such it this is like every fistula within tumor which is most difficult now the interesting finding in this particular case even such case we can take up endoscopically what stopped us from taking endoscopic is see this tumor which has gone intracranial to the uh, middle cranial fossa the region number 1 see this vessel where this vessel is coming from the middle cerebral circulation if you have see this vessel coming to the tumor coming from the middle cerebral circulation and if you happen to remove this tumor from below avulging this vessel would be a disaster second see this this vessel this vessel is a branch from the mca this vessel is a branch from the mca coming directly to the tumor see inside the tumor such huge huge branches from the mca coming to the tumor to me is a direct contraindication for an open approach and in such cases we add on the subtemporal approach to have a good exposure from below and up you can remove the upper part of the tumor first devascularize from the mca branches and push it down and you can remove whatever you can play your game from below then you are pretty safe to do that rather than playing everything from below and that sometimes can be a disaster so this is one of the most decision making uh, you know a point when you take this call by means of diagnosis by means of the ct angiogram this is another interesting example you know we were all set looking at the mri of the patient we were all set to deliver this patient endoscopically see this this is the tumor this is the tumor tumor this is a, this is a huge lateral extension which is no way any contraindication to endoscopy we segmentalize and remove in parts and this is the internal maxillary uh, branches now as you go behind this tumor was going to the orbital apex and then laterally this is the dura this tumor was completely extradural it looks like you know uh, so simple to deliver endoscopically Uh, as far as the contraindications are concerned looking like no contraindication in this particular situation when we got a ct angiogram the situation completely changed altogether now look at the ct angiogram of this particular patient see this is so important you can avoid a big disaster by all these means now coming to the ct angiogram in this particular patient if i reconstruct to the coronal one see this this coronal ct angiogram now this is the vessel this vessel see there's the main mca is giving a huge branch to the tumor from above if i try to bring it down from below it can be a disaster see the ica giving huge branch to the tumor this to me is an absolute contraindication for any endoscopic approach if you try to do this is something uh, i would say a disaster and for patient it is never never safe so my 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 uh, you know uh, our uh, philosophy is to get a ct angiogram see how the vessels entering into the tumor to take a call whether it can be taken by open or endoscopic approach whether there is a need for embolization if suppose the tumor is limited where the vessels are coming from behind we would take a call of embolization rather than going to the tumor and catch the vessel then another indication for open approach look at this patient this was one of the most massive jnas we have uh, removed and the simple regions uh, the decision making was not difficult in this particular patient for the regions i tell you uh, this is a uh, arterial you know arterial yeah so this particular patient look at the tumor this was tracheostomized tracheostomized and see uh just a minute yes see this is tracheostomized and this was the tumor this was the tumor and see how it is coming from the nose nasal pharynx right to the facial soft tissues across the mandible and eyeball skull base intracranial space and see the vessels the branches of the uh, carotid 
the huge carotid like branches passing many many such branches passing to the tumor uh let me take this um, mvp uh, protocol to show you vessels much better mip mip sequences yes now now see this tumor with a huge facial extension we followed each and every vessel going to this and this tumor had a huge vascularity from the superficial temporal artery which you anyway can't control by an endoscopy this kind of a mass lesion you can't control endoscopically for it see the carotid artery carotid and carotid like branches passing through the tumor many such branches passing huge huge branches coming from the internal carotid passing to the tumor is a certain contraindication and the carotid since was 360 degrees submerged we did open approach we did the uh, uh, dsa before we uh, you know sacrifice the main vessel pre operatively by means of coiling as the cross flow was good and could be able to remove the tumor completely by maxillary swing and the subtemporal approach so you have to uh, take a call and there are certain open approaches we need to know in our practice for that we can take a call in those given situation it's not that always uh, that uh, the endoscopy is the proper approach of choice open approaches do have their place in those conditions we need to uh, you know identify those identify those indications in in certain sequence uh, situations so the uh, the work up is very important uh, as i mentioned about the angiograms the need of mri the vascularity see the diagnosis you can actually see the vessel how the level of the vessel when you take the uh, internal maxillary in control and this is the mri mri angiogram i can uh, skip this so coming to the bleeding aspect what all you can do to manage the bleeding see as i said there are many sources of bleeding uh, to this tumor this is a pure vascular tumor the bleeding can come to the external carotid system uh, system sometimes bilateral and the principal vessel is the internal maxillary and as the tumor grows further to the parapharyngeal space to the roof of the infratemporal fossa and other areas it can acquire some other vessels like uh, coming from the ascending pharyngeal and the middle meningeal it can have as you have seen the branches from the internal carotid system as the tumor uh, you know invades the skull base uh, deeply and of course the venous bleeding particularly from the pterygoid plexus and the cavernous and the other venous system area so there are three sources of bleeding external carotid internal carotid and venous bleeding now what does the embolization do there are the see the list of uh, you know maneuvers to reduce the bleeding overall during surgery embolization is the principal one which is being practiced over the across the world maybe pre operatively intra operative embolization there are so many you know uh, methods to embolize nowadays the newer techniques to embolize nowadays we have tried in few patients you know besides uh, you know coil embolization particle embolization glue embolization and now we have tried in a couple of patient the onyx embolization the cost is a limiting factor but truly if you ask me the best of the embolization situation what you get from is the onyx is a liquid material very very safe can't enter the dangerous to the dangerous anastomosis to the internal carotid system pretty safe and it can reach to the microvascular vasculature of the tumor if you embolize with the coils you don't reach to the microvascular level particles may not reach to the depth uh, and if you try to use smaller particle then the chances of you know through the dangerous anastomosis to the internal carotid system are high so there are limitations for so many things but onyx is really good the cost is a limiting factor along with that the control hypotensive anesthesia coagulation we use which i am going to show in one of our few of our videos the then other techniques you all know flow seal surgery so many things you can use intraoperatively to control the bleeding so like these are the techniques of embolization i am not going in the details but there are certain embol advantages why people are practicing the reason is one and only the reduction in the overall blood loss you can maintain your visualization reduce the need of transfusion more and more and you can take care of surgically inaccessible arterial feeding vessel by completely embolizing them this is one of the biggest advantage i would say uh, besides the bleeding control 
So overall operating time is reduced, your visualization is reduced, and you are more confident in removing uh, such tumors, larger tumors, rather than having without embolization. But it is not all free of complications. There are certain concerns also with the embolization. Availability of the good embolization facility, the expert embolization team, the cost sometimes, the cost exceeds the cost of the surgery, particularly in country like India, the cost is a big factor for poor patients. The risk of thromboembolism because of the dangerous anosmosis, you have to be careful. The embolized, the intervention radiologist should be very, very experienced. The effectiveness is, as I mentioned about the embolization, reaching to the microvasculature level, which is very, very important. More than that, this has been studied through, I have gone through certain publications that people have studied the tumor margins. You know, without embolizing, when you go without embolization, your tumor is seen distinctly from your surrounding areas as compared to the embolized time where your tumor margins are difficult. They get collapsed and sometimes this tumor, which has a tendency to, you know, enter into the narrow crevices and canal from the pterygopeltine fossa to here and there. And the tumor, collapsed tumor, can be sometimes difficult to identify and you leave behind the part of the tumor which is the major cause for the so-called recurrence. So overall, it has been, you know, published. The recurrences are overall high in the embolized patients as compared to the non embolized So the embolization is something uh, not free of problems. And what you all, you achieve by the embolization, you don't actually embolize the internal carotid system bleeding. If you have a vessels coming from the internal carotid, you know, system to the tumor, you practically don't embolize and you have to, face that bleeding, you have to prepare yourself with extra blood and other maneuvers to reduce that overall bleeding. Venous bleeding, you can't do anything by means of embolization. What you all achieve with the embolization is the bleeding from the external carotid system. And in those situations, the majority of the time, it is the internal maxillary, which is the principal vessel. And once internal maxillary is the principal vessel and you have a CT angiogram, how it is entering to the tumor, what we do intraoperatively, Rather than a pre-operative embolization without wasting time, energy, and money into that, we go intraoperatively, go to the vessel first rather than a tumor by means of our straightforward dankers. Uh, the vessel comes from lateral. Catch the vessel first, intraoperatively devascularize the tumor and then remove it like any other tumor rather than, you know, embolizing all patients. And we take the call of embolization upon, uh, based upon the, various vessels coming to the tumor, like such large tumor, which has a vessel coming from the ascending pharyngeal branch, which has a vessel coming from the middle maxillary, and those vessels, vessels, uh, this is internal maxillary, which you can, of course, um, uh, catch before handling the tumor, but these two vessels coming from behind, you can't catch, and these are the ideal candidates for embolization, because to handle, to catch these vessels, you have to go through the tumor, which is impractical that is not possible and these are the ideal candidates for embolization rather than you know indiscriminately embolizing every patient that is something a change in the surgical technique which we have been uh, following and uh, propagating so uh, the, this slide is about the categorization for the junior colleagues whether they can handle these tumors according to their facility their expertise tumors which invade the skull base tumors which do not invade the skull base this is how you can categorize them into various categories according to your competence to remove that tumor. That is something different, different thing to discuss here. Now coming to the endoscopy in the open, we have already discussed uh, during the CT angiogram part, which patients, which uh, they don't do endoscopic, majority of the patient will do endoscopy for the advantage, for the certain advantage is not that the endoscopy is avoiding a scar is a big advantage. Any tumor or any, any, any procedure, if, I am doing with the open approach with certain distinct advantage. I'll opt for that rather than endoscopy. So one has to have a, a advantage for opting for the endoscopy rather than simply avoiding a scar. And here, you all know the illumination, the kind of illumination endoscopy gives. On-site magnification and illumination is the major advantage of the endoscopic system. This tumor has a tendency, as I said, to uh, you know, spread to the, through the various fissures and canals and the hidden corners, which you can see through the endoscope much better with the wide angle endoscope. And secondly, the most important thing for the so-called recurrence is the tumor has a tendency to invade the aversion system of the 
pterygoid and the sphenoid bone which you can drill very well under endoscopic guidance which cannot be achieved of that level by any open approach that is the major major advantage why we go with the endoscopy not for simply avoiding a scar but still in the patient safety uh, uh, you know uh, point of view we take a call of open approach in certain indications which i have already uh, i have already mentioned few words about the recurrence you know the recurrence is have many reasons and the biggest one is the inadequate assessment and the planning this is something i mentioned and that's why i mentioned in beginning in detail about the dynamic ct angiogram which gives you a lot of information about the tumor extension vascularity you know the various vessels how they enter into the tumor so that assessment and planning is the key a fault in the assessment and planning can lead to a uh, overall you know uh, failure marrow infiltration is one of the biggest reason particularly pterygoid and the sphenoid bone that you need to completely drill away if you happen to leave a smallest portion of the tumor it can regrow to a bigger size and those recurrences are believe me uh, i mean much more difficult to handle than the primary tumor then tumors having significant icf blood supply which you are handling are you know more uh, more difficult to clear up completely more difficult to ensure a complete clearance and then the recurrence is imminent significant intraoperative bleeding is one of the factor where you can't identify uh, about the tumor clearance 100% and that is one of the uh, the source of recurrence and surgical expertise whatever is very very important where you go by the endoscopic and open approach one must be well versed with all this and for particularly for the endoscopic surgeon i would say even in this endoscopic era endoscopy the advantage we must be well versed with certain open approaches in our practice in a uh, certain given situation like maxillary swing sub temporal sometimes the lateral anatomy uh, and uh, the the this uh, uh, one of the uh, mid facial degloving and all these approaches one must be well versed in certain given situation so these are the indications for the open approaches particularly in the revision situation with in encasement of the major vessels particularly carotid artery this is the contraindication for any endoscopic approach as you cannot handle the internal carotid laceration as effectively as then the uh, compared to the open approach and that is something contraindicated in many of the our patients many of our patients having complete encasement of the carotid as i mentioned we got the dsa done with a good cross flow we got the carotid artery coiled from Uh, a few millimeter or centimeter proximal distal to the involved segment and remove the tumor from the carotid completely that gives you an opportunity without lacerating the vessel and say so that is one of the way otherwise in majority of the encasement situation we go by the open approach and if you have to you know it is imminent to give a laceration then it is better to avoid that and leave those particular patients most difficult situation for the post operative radiation radiation is never a treatment of choice but it reserved for only those patients where the surgery can be more uh, you know something endangers the life this is uh, now one of the surgical strategy about removing the uh, division of the tumor see in the present context we have been able to remove more and more bigger tumors by endoscopy and that strategy is possible by means of division of the tumor see this patient the huge infratemporal fossa cheek extension what we need to do is you can't deliver this tumor as a whole what we do take the vessel in control first divide the tumor at the lateral end of the nasal cavity or the medial end of the maxilla deliver the uh, medial part first to the oral cavity acquire some more space to bring in the lateral part and deliver it separately so sometimes this segmentalization of the tumor is an important you know strategy to remove the bigger tumor sometimes we segmentalize into 3 4 5 6 in a bigger tumor we have we have done even 12 segments of the tumor to deliver such tumor so before i uh, you know uh, finish it i would like to uh, take you a couple of minutes i know we are our session is already running behind the schedule quickly i will take you some of the important uh, you know uh, the surgical steps so this is the endoscopic picture unedited i will quickly run this our 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 tool of choice is the coblation this is a prosize max 
population when it is like uh, one in three, three in one tool. See this, um, the, this irrigation all the time, coagulation, cutting, everything is available with a suction attached to it. So what we do first for the danker, uh, just uh, you know, this uh, uh, coagulate the lateral wall of the nose, the turbinate, everything to minimize the bleeding, and then. You can ablate, remove sorry, this. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Yes, uh, we are not able to see the video. You're not are able you not able to see. To oh, now? Yes, yes, we can now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. So the, uh, let me uh, go back. This is the tumor. First, we do the surface coagulation to reduce the surface vasculitis. The majority of the vasculitis of the tumor. The prominent one is on the surface. More and more center part is getting necros on the surface of the more and more vessel. And it reduce, helps in reducing the size of the tumor. Then coagulation is used to, uh, you know, coagulate the lateral wall mucoperiosteum. You can remove this. This is the level of the piriform aperture. This is the anterolateral wall here on this side. And this is the medial wall of the maxilla. And our in dankers or modified dankers, our role is, this is the medial wall of the maxilla. Entire mucoperiosteum being removed completely removed and now this anterolateral wall is being removed and see this is how the head on entry into the maxillary sinus being made you can do it by means of a micro drill see this is the head on entry into the maxillary sinus you can go ahead with a chisel and hammer quickly micro drill is more uh, you know precise more sophisticated and coagulation is always all the time helps you uh, you know having a good visualization. The only thing which comes in between is the nasolacrimal system, which we always advocate. Flushing it, flushing it, cut it flush uh, uh, with the orbital floor. So it doesn't hang any more down to get fibros. And this is how, see this, the nasolacrimal duct being cut. Flush with the floor of the orbit, it doesn't come in your way. And see, this is the uh, nasolacrimal system. This is how you can prevent the post-operative epiphora. This is your maxillary sinus. See, this is the nasolacrimal duct. This is maxillary sinus behind the posterior wall uh, in front of you. And now I go quickly behind. This is the posterior wall of the maxilla. See the brilliant illumination, magnification. Now the posterior wall of the maxilla being removed. This because of the tumor pressure behind many a times it thinned out on its own because of the tumor. You remove the posterior wall. This is the mucoperiosteum of the pterygopalatine fossa. That's the mucoperiosteum of the pterygopeltan fossa. And as I had shown in the uh, CT angiogram, the tumor itself pushes the vessel anteriorly. The moment you open up the, the mucoperiosteum, this periosteum of the pterygopeltan fossa, the first structure are the vessels, the vascular network. The, 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 the neural network is far behind. And see, with the coagulator, you can easily, easily find the vessel. This is the vessel here. We knew all, we always knew by means of a CT angiogram the level of the vessel where you are going to find. And this is the major vessel. And in this tumor, particularly, these vessels get enlarged. They are much bigger than the regular, you know, uh, uh, this thing. Oh, I went far ahead. Let me go back. Go back. See, this is the vessel in the loop. Uh, by means of a, a ball probe, and then you can quickly apply your uh, uh, this thing. See this? Clips. You can apply your clips easily, and this is how, once the vessel is clipped, you can divide it, and this part of the tumor is uh, practically devascularized. So you can apply your clip. See, two clips at least to stay on the safer side and then see these two clips the vessel has been clipped and then you can divide the tumor over here along with the vessel once you divide this your tumor is segregated see this part of the tumor is segregated from the this part of the tumor which can you can remove um, uh, after the medial part of the tumor has been removed and this is practically devascular so these are the cases you always do without embolization always without embolization turbinates are preferentially, you know, invaded by the tumor. Very often, the middle and the inferior turbinate you can remove. I can remove the turbinate. Quickly, I'm going behind. This sort of sinusotomy is done above to see any tumor going up into the 
paranasal sinuses this tumor is a, a you know a preferentially uh, it invades the sphenoid sinus through the floor go through the sphenoid sinus uh, to the floor of the sphenoid sinus this is the sphenoid sinus i am uh, floor being exposed and then this entire tumor which is exposed you can divide at the medial end of the maxilla see this tumor segmentalization quickly i without wasting time this is the medial part across the uh, the nasal septum sometimes from here the medial side it acquires the vascularity from the opposite sinopalatine system this is to the septotomy behind going to the opposite side this is opposite side in the nasal pharynx and see how the tumor is it is free it is not attached anywhere except the roof of the uh, the nasal pharynx where it, you need to separate from the periosteal plane this is how you segregate from all around segregate from all around and then see this this is segmentalization by means of ablation this is pure segmentalization of the tumor you remove this part of the tumor and deliver to the nasal pharynx by means of finally divided dividing at the level of the nasal pharyngeal a roof and this is how this tumor is being delivered intraoral now the most important part of the tumor this particular tumor had an invasion in the pterygoid process which i am going to i really want to show to everyone to prevent recurrence this is one of the major ways to prevent recurrence see this this is the tumor occupied in the entire pterygoid process entire pterygoid is full of uh, tumor and this part of the tumor this pterygoid bone you know this tumor has the ability to infiltrate the marrow part of the pterygoid bone it invades the haversian system of the pterygoid bone and how simply uh, you can remove it see this let me show this uh, let me show this it is going to come yeah this is all pterygoid bone now pick up this tumor you have to pull it gently this is the major this is the crux behind expose the complete this is the remnant remnant of the pterygoid process being exposed this is something i really want to emphasize once you remove the pterygoid let me show i am quickly going ahead with the, with the because of the time i don't want to cross the limit and this is how this is this is the tumor this entire tumor this is the maxillary sinus this part we have removed and this is the infratemporal fossa behind and this pterygoid tumor has to go let me show how to lift up see this tumor has to be lifted see this tumor being lifted off the pterygoid bone see how this tumor infiltrates the haversian system of the bone that is the crux you need to remove it gently gently pull it don't break it don't break it don't pull all the way in one go quickly see this that this is the marrow bone of the pterygoid this is how you can pull it from the pterygoid this is the sphenoid base and actually you can remove the entire tumor in one go by multiple goes not in one go one go means the entire tumor in toto but in multiple multiple attempts quickly gently gently pull it and look at the uh, the openings the openings in the bone never ever try to pack here this bleeding with anything with the goes in any micro tumor left behind would be pushed inside the opening if you try to control the bleeding here by means of packing never ever pack anything let the blood come out let the blood come out for a while it will stop automatically once the tumor is out pterygoid itself never bleeds it is the tumor which bleeds so always always gently keep removing gently keep removing gently any given extension of the tumor can be removed endoscopically provided it is a segmentalized under vision gently pull it from wherever it is going to the orbit to the cavernous sinus to the intracranial space parapharyngeal space uh, orbital fissures anywhere see this tumor being gently gently pulled of the pterygoid and never ever pack it at this point of time to remove the tumor completely and once it is removed 
let on drill away this entire pterygoid bone many times we drill to the, drill the pterygoid to the level that it doesn't exist at all this is how one can easily under vision remove this tumor and this cannot be achieved with this much of illumination and magnification by any open approach and this is the major region why we consider that the endoscopic approach is the approach of choice to deal with such tumors this is what the message i wanted to give here it is not because of the uh, you know see now the finally the bone the drill the high speed drill being used to drill away this entire pterygoid process completely to remove every small microscopic part of the tumor extending to the this bone and this is the major cause to the so called recurrence this is the major cause and in the open approach it cannot be i would say it is not possible to remove this tumor with this much of efficiency illumination and visualization and this kind of the drilling is not possible in that approach to ensure that your tumor has been completely removed and that is how such tumors can be dealt with thank you so much for your uh, uh, you know attention uh, i am sure i have not exceeded the time thank you dr ashok rokade once again for this opportunity and um, if anybody has any questions or anything i'll be more than happy to answer them thank you so much Thank you, Dr. Jain. That was uh, excellent. Very detailed uh, explanation about how you assess these tumors, how you uh, investigate, and the surgical planning is the key. And the take-home message is uh, rather than going straight for the tumor, is to surround the tumor and um, then go for the kill. Um, there was a question on the uh, Q and A chat room asking if you would consider using the micro debrider on uh, for JNA resection. Uh... micro debrider is a fast cutting tool you know it has its own application indication but jna we refer to use micro debrider for its uh, inability to control the bleeding why we use the coagulator for its ability to control the bleeding it for its ability of coagulation for its ability for cutting at the same time irrigation and you know uh, the suction yes 
in one situation we have done one case when we started using onyx we used for a smaller tumor the entire tumor turned black once the entire microvasculature of the tumor was injected with the onyx and we literally removed the tumor with the micro debridor with hardly any bleeding so uh, uh, that is a different situation but otherwise micro debridor is not a preferred tool for the tumor itself for exposure you saw me using micro debridor for other regions and uh, that is different for but tumor micro debridor is not a uh, preferential tool thank you uh, no further questions from the uh, the chat lines we just um, uh, uh, poll about how many of the delegates uh, embolize the tumors so uh, i'm just sharing the results i think uh, around 60% of them said uh, they, they do embolize the tumor and uh, around 30% is good i believe 60 70% of them actually performing the surgery so that's quite a uh, impressive number of the delegates present see i tell you why people are embolizing only for one reason the fear of bleeding that's why i mentioned we need to critically analyze what what actually we are getting out of embolization if i have a tumor with exclusive blood supply coming from the internal maxillary why would i uh, you know spend my time energy and money for the embolization i would go intraoperatively first catch the vessel and get through without embolization thus we have done in our hundreds of cases we have a long series of more than 400 cases now out of which majority have been done without embolization embolization we do with certain indication but not you know irrespective of the extension and other indication uh, asho you and i are based in the uk and i see louise also um, on on the panelists um, um um list i think it would be very difficult for us um as ent surgeons in the uk to justify not uh discussing preoperative and en geography and embolization um you know with the with the with the patient with the parents and and offer that as a standard of care um so i appreciate that that in other centers uh, in other practices embolization uh is is not not necessarily optional but it it's 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 preference of the surgical team but i think in the uk overall given that the numbers are significantly lower i, I think you would agree that that not even thinking or discussing embolization is is a significant uh clinical issue uh, that can 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 quite easily and quite quickly go into medical legal yes it can Nothing be one of the is, issues we should give all the options to the patient i agree with you yeah but all pros and cons of um, uh, surgery with or without embolization pros and cons of embolization itself because embolization as i mentioned is not free of complications Right. So yes, you're right. We have to give all the options to the patient to choose for. And I, I totally agree, Satisha. So, so in in our workup of all our patients, and certainly we we do not have over four uh, hundred, but in, in certainly in our workup of all these patients, um, um, the patient in the family, if they are um, a, a child, will have a separate con consultation with the interventional radiologist. Uh, to go through uh, the procedure and, and expected complications um so so they do tend to see quite a few people before they they come back to the surgical team with a decision and certainly the last uh, 10 jnas that that we've done in liverpool over the past 3 years none of them uh, have have said no no embolization uh, but i i suspect that that's how we have kind of steered the the, the parents and the patients yes and you know as i mentioned about the onyx onyx is a wonderful very very safe you know embolization material if your insurance permit if the patient you know uh, financially permits is no doubt that the onyx makes a difference onyx is simply amazing it definitely drastically reduces the bleeding the cost is a limiting factor for one vial costing $1000 how many vials needed maybe and one of the patient we needed 12 vials $12000 for the embolization is a huge price and that's why i said this is one of the biggest limiting factor particularly in a uh, developing country like us i don't know how the insurance is working there in your country or uh, to you know uh, give onyx i don't know exactly you can, you know better but this is something important thank you thank you 
Thank Ashok, you once again, I... Dr. Ashok Rukade, for everything, for giving this opportunity. Thank you all. Yeah, it was a pleasure having you. The head and neck surgeries you perform are vital. Your patients place their trust in you. You help them continue to speak and smile, eat and drink, hear and comfort. You're committed to helping them continue to live fully, to feel deeply, and to enjoy the quality of life they've come to expect. That means being confident that you're protecting and preserving your patient's head and neck nerve function during procedures. Introducing NIM Vital, the next generation of nerve monitoring technology. NIM Vital provides advanced nerve monitoring that helps you reduce the risk of nerve damage during head and neck procedures. Detailed intraoperative nerve condition information helps inspire your surgical strategy. An intuitive user interface with a wire-free patient interface allows for easy setup and enhanced visualization from the surgical field. Real-time notifications of nerve conditions, visually and audibly. Green, yellow, and red status bars provide visual information, and their associated tones provide audible cues, making monitoring function easier than ever. NIM Nerve Trend EMG reporting enables nerve condition tracking throughout a procedure, even when using intermittent nerve monitoring. And when paired with a NIM continuous monitoring electrode, you have continuous nerve monitoring informing your surgical strategy. NIM Vital pushes the boundaries of monitoring nerve function in various procedures in head and neck surgery. With real-time information available during surgery, giving you confidence in nerve function. Because protecting patients' nerves and senses is more than vital. NIM Vital. you could do even more to bring relief to your chronic rhinosinusitis patients with technology customized to your unique clinical and facility needs. Introducing Stealth Station Flex ENT Navigation System, a customizable system from Medtronic ENT, a market leader in image-guided surgery technology. Featuring six hardware configurations, an optional portable cart, two different electromagnetic emitter options. With flexibility in hardware design and optional software functionality, get everything you need and nothing you don't with Stealth Station Flex ENT. Let's flex forward. Contact your Medtronic representative to customize a navigation solution that's right for you.